All right, so today we're going to do lecture five. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about how we come up with uh, forwards and future prices. Um, so we, we just did um, the interest rates. And so uh, when we talk about R, uh, that, that's what we're calling upon is that continuously compounded um, rate, right? So these are going to be uh, based on that presumption. Um, one thing to, to point out is this difference between consumption and investment assets. So uh, a consumption asset um, is something that you're using, right? So if you think about oil or copper or um, pork bellies that we turn into bacon, right? In, anything that uh, we're going to use up, right? That's going to be a consumption asset um, where some things like gold and, and platinum and palladium um, may just be held uh, for investment purposes. So there are uh, mechanical uses for gold. Uh, obviously there's, there's like jewelry and stuff, but also like with electronics and, and things like that. Um, and same with silver, uh, we use that with, with some electrical, uh, electronic work. And um, so there's, there's things that have a, um, a use. I mean, we, we would be able to consume these assets, but then if you have a large number of people holding it, um, purely for uh, investment, right? It's to hedge some currency risk or something like that. Um, then, then we're gonna call those investment assets. I also wanna remind you about the concept of short selling. So you should have seen this in an earlier course, but just to um, sort of bring, bring this back, the uh, short selling it involves you borrowing a security uh, from someone else uh, and then you will go and then sell that in the market, right? And so uh, this is this is legal. Uh, you're borrowing it from people that have authorized this uh, use of their security. So it's not something that they're doing behind anyone's back. Um, and why would you, as a person that owns like a hundred shares of Microsoft, why would you allow this to happen? Uh, because when they're using it in that way, they have to pay you uh, for that that privilege of using it. So um, you're going to basically extract rent um, out of your, um, your security. So, um, and at some point they have to go in and replace it because they, they owe it to you. Uh, if the stock were to pay any dividend, then the owner of the stock, if it's my 100 shares of Microsoft and they paid a dollar a share, then they're going to have to pay me $100 because that's due to me even though they've turned around and sold those shares in the market and someone else has received the dividend that was paid uh, by Microsoft. So, um, <clears throat> and then there's, there may be a small fee. There, there will be a small fee. Uh, it, it's not a large amount of money, but it is enough money uh, for this market to exist, right? You have to incentivize people uh, to let you borrow it. And so, um, so there is, there is a, a small fee that will be, Paid. And if you have a very large portfolio, that bit of, of income would um, could, could add up to something significant. Um, and so when I go through these formulas, um, anytime you see S, that's a spot price, and a capital F is a futures or a forward price, um, I will put a subscript. Uh, and so you should notice on the slide, S sub zero, F sub zero, that's at time zero, which is today. Uh, you may see a lowercase t, that just means for any random time t, uh, and if I put a capital T, that means at the date of, of delivery or, um, you know, some sort of maturity if we were doing something else, but, uh, but capital T is the final time. Uh, and then we're going to use R, the risk-free interest rate. Remember, this is the continuously compounded um, rate, um, so that's, and, and we're using continuous compounding because of the way this math works out. Okay. And so what if there's a spot price for a stock? It's $40. The stock does not pay dividends, right? And you see in the forward price in the three month uh, from now, um, it would be 43 or maybe 39, right? Um, and then we have this interest rate of 5% um, per year. Right, so is there an arbitrage opportunity, right? And so um, it's, it's, I guess, two different questions, right? 43 or 39, but we'll, we'll kind of look at this, right? So 
uh, the spot price, right? Now, now that's going to be S sub uh, zero, right? We have a forward price, um, and then we have our interest rate R, right? And so uh, the way we um, calculate the pricing, right? Um, the spot price of the investment is S sub zero, the futures price uh, is F sub zero, right? And so what we would say is, well, we expect that futures price to be the spot price, but uh, we're gonna have this interest rate R, right? And then we're gonna uh, have T amount of time. So um, we were told that the spot price is currently $40. We were told that the interest rate uh, was 5%, but we only have a quarter of a year because it's three months. So T is 0.25. Uh, and then that gives us uh, a, a futures price of $40.50. So if it's $39, then yes, there's an arbitrage opportunity. If there's, if it's 43, um, you know, potentially um, that one as well. Um, so uh, as I said, we're gonna normally use uh, continuous compounding. So if you look here, um, this one plus R to the T, um, if you um, modify this, right? One plus R over some compounding period M, right? And then you raise that to the T times M, right? Cause you're gonna have that many more periods. Um, you know, over, over a finite time span, as M approaches infinity, then you, you see it goes to this E to the RT, right? So, uh, so when, that's why we like to do continuous compounding rate right? because it ends up being um, so much easier for us to, to calculate uh, what that would be. Um, <clears throat> and I, I put a note in there, this equation uh, is the forward and the spot for anything that has no income and no storage costs. So we're gonna modify this slightly um, if it generates income or if we have to pay to store it. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that that can be given to us, right? So we could have a flat dollar amount uh, and I'll show you how we'll handle that. Or it could also be a percentage, right? So uh, we expect this, but we also expect to pay 1% in handling costs or, or something like that. And so we can we can do it either as a percentage basis or as a as a flat dollar amount as we go through here. Okay. Um, what if you can't short sell, right? Because a lot of times with our markets we assume short selling because it allows for the market to be complete, right? Um, <clears throat> so in our case, it's a bit different because we're contracting now for some future delivery, and there's always two people on, on either side of the um, contract in the future. Um, and so we can still like synthetically short, right? Because we can take the other sides and different contracts and things like that. So, um, so we're still gonna be able to, to complete our market. So, um, and now I mentioned that the income or, or the fees paid or anything like that could be a dollar amount or it could be some percentage. If it's a dollar amount, so in this case, you know, uh, we're gonna have to pay, you know, some fixed amount, uh, then you would just subtract that fixed amount from what the current spot price is, right? Um, now, since we're subtracting off what that is, we're, we're gonna need it to be in the present value. So if that payment's gonna occur in six months, then we would take that six month amount and then bring it back using that same discount rate to the present day. Uh, and then you would subtract that off from the current spot price. If instead of it being a fixed income amount, like a dollar figure, and instead they say, oh, it's gonna be 1% or 2%, um, you know, that's what it pays, right? Then we would subtract that percentage off from that risk-free rate of return. And, and the reason that you're seeing negative, negative I and this negative Q is like, why, why am I subtracting it if it generates money? And it, you have to think from the point of view of the other side, the, the person um, with this, uh, you know, uh, futures contract, right? They're, they have to make up for all this lost income to the person, um, you know, that would have it at the spot. 
right? So that's that's why we would um, need to subtract that because that that's income that should be held um, by the the person um, at the spot. Okay. Um, as far as contracts themselves, uh, when we create the contract, um, we create it to not have any unbalance, right? Because we're creating it, right? So we um, um, we would we would want it to not incur some fee right up front necessarily. Of course, of course there could be. Uh, I mentioned the, the bid offer spread effects. So there, there could be things that exist out there that that cause small uh, deviations from zero right at creation, but uh, but it's not going to be uh, like it will in, in three months or six months where you could have a lot of growth or decay in the underlying um, and, and there'd be a significant change in the value of this, this contract. So, um, and so as we go through um, these forward contracts, I'm going to use the capital K and that's the delivery price. Okay, so that's not the spot price today. That's S, right? It's not the forward price, right? Which is F. So, um, but but you'll see how we, we use that term in here, right? So, um, since we, um, you know, we, we assume up front it's going to be zero, right? But um, we would, you know, modify um, our uh, delivery price and the, um, the contracted price, right? The, the value is just gonna be that difference. Uh, you see the F sub zero minus K, right? So that's the, the delivery price is what we've contracted that we're going to, to um, have, right? And then the delivery price is what would be paid for um, delivery, um, you know, at that, at that future time. And then we have to discount that back to today. Uh, and so it has a positive value as long as F sub zero is greater than K. So if you're long, you want F sub zero greater than K. Uh, if you're short, you see the, the value of the short contract below, you want K to be larger than F sub zero, right? If you're, if you're short on this position. Um, you notice that the E is to the negative RT. That's because this is a future that we're bringing back to the present day. So if you're, if you're taking today's spot price and you're growing to some future value, then it's a positive RT. This is starting with our future value. Was, I know it's, it's a forward, not a future, but I'm saying in the future, right? It will have this value. So we want to bring it back to the present day and that's why it's negative RT. Okay. Um, and so just understand too, um, the, the, the purpose on this slide is uh, basically we, we expect things to converge, right? The, the, if we were going, this is for a June contract, when we get to June, um, then you would expect, you know, the futures, the, the forward, um, and then whatever the asset is, you know, um, they would, they would, you know, presume to all converge to this equal price, right? Uh, however, um, that can not be the case because of uh, interest rates, right? So um, if interest rates are positively correlated, right? So when interest rates go up, if that makes this particular asset goes up, um, then that would imply that the futures price would be slightly higher than the forward price. If it's a negative correlation, so if interest rates go up and that causes the asset price itself to go down, then the forward would be higher than the future. Um, and this, you, you kind of have to think, remember that, that we're talking about things like indices and things like that too, because you may say like, well, what does interest rates have to do with pork prices? Or what do interest rates have to do with gold? Um, you know, and, and well, gold's a little bit different because it is held as an investment. But if you start thinking of like our indexes, right? And you can, you can do uh, contracts based on what the S&P will be or what the Dow Jones Industrial will be and, and things like that. So uh, there are things that have uh, correlation, um, you know, with interest rates, uh, positive or negative. So 
Um, and so that can cause this, this type of, of separation. Uh, oh, and so here we are, here's a stock index. So um, uh, the, in here, you notice this looks a lot like that equation we had where we said that there was gonna be a fixed income um, that would come uh, off of your investment. So if it was a, a fixed dollar amount, we put S sub zero minus I in parentheses. When it was a percentage, we said R minus Q and had that in, per, per, um, uh, in parentheses. Uh, so you see in this one, Q, right, is the dividend yield. So this would be income, right, the dividends, right, that would be, would be paid out. And we're, we've written it as a yield. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's written as a yield, so it's a percentage, right? This is this is a rate, right? Um, and so it would be R minus Q in this case. So when we're dealing with uh, things like stocks, um, these indices, you, you'll see it looks like it did before because the math is just the math, right? And it's um, we we can approach it in multiple ways. Okay. Um, so. Um, Okay, and, and just understand that um, the index has to be an investment asset. Um, and the, the issue could be, if you notice that third bullet point, the Nikkei index. Now the Nikkei is, is uh, the Japanese index, right? So it's using the, uh, the stock exchange um, in Tokyo, right? And, but if, if we have that quoted in dollars, um, that's different, right? Because um, the changes in the index um, may be reflected in the price, but so could fluctuations of the yen versus the dollar, right? So that's, uh, this, this is why the, the, a lot of times you'll see a lot of preference for dollar denominated investments, um, you know, because it, it allows for a lot more flexibility in that way. Um, now, as we mentioned, that we would uh, expect, um, you know, that that to be an equality, not an inequality. Uh, however, we said if there's this correlation, right, between your investment and um, the index, uh, then you can end up with um, with that divergence. Um, and so, uh, just here's an example: if we if we look out and the future is overpriced relative to where we think it should be, um, then we sell that future, right? The future is greater than, than the, our calculation for what the spot should grow to, right? Uh, and so instead we should buy the stocks and sell the future, right? And if the future was, was lower, uh, then you buy the future and then you sell all the stocks. What you're trying to do is buy the thing that's underpriced and you sell the thing that's overpriced. Right, and so by doing that, by by selling um, that, that's how you you arbitrage away this position because you you bought uh, and sold. You did it at the same time, but the delivery will occur in the future. Um, so you, it's it, it's almost metaphysical, I suppose. Your your the way your time is is moving in this uh, situation, but um, but it's a way for you to synthetically short. Right, because you can you can buy one and sell the other, uh, and then you can create that that position um, to to arbitrage of mispricing. All right, um, just just want to point out that we we can't do this uh, as as people uh, anyway, just because we don't have the kind of resources. Right, this is uh, this is a lot of money because you're buying huge portfolios of stocks and and offsetting it with these contracts. Um, but also just because you're having to make so many trades at the exact same time, because your mispricing is always fluctuating um, because stock prices are moving independently all the time. So, um, so this is where algorithmic trading comes in. This is where the computers just run their formulas and then when they see things move into a particular position, they execute trades. Um, the trades they execute are you know, processed in, in like milliseconds and the, the, the money moves. And as a market, we like that. Um, a lot of people think that it's grown to be too much of the market because it, um, now we're kind of jumping at ghosts, I guess. But, um, 
But the good thing is it would always correct those mispricings, right? Because you wouldn't want there to be in the mispricing. You would rather grab the, the pennies of a dollar and just do that thousands of times every day. And so uh, you'd have a lot of these types of firms. Um, it, occasionally, you may not be able to do simultaneous trades. There may be uh, issues where a market is shut down temporarily or there's some sort of technical issue somewhere. Um, or, or something like that. Uh, and so in that case, you know, you would possibly have, you know, breakdowns, but that, that can occur anytime there's a market disruption. Uh, but that would also be true here. Uh, the important thing is, you know, that uh, we, we've talked about the size of this market, right? And so very small fluctuations, very small mispricings um, could end up having a very large um, effect. Uh, you can also have currencies. Um, and so from an investment standpoint, again, just going back to the math, this is just some rate of return, right? Whatever this, um, you know, the euros uh, risk-free rate of return is. Um, and so what we would say is then, okay, well, the difference in our um, risk-free return and then what would be a risk-free rate of return in some foreign um, currency um, and then we could then calculate what that should be uh, a future or forward uh, on this contract that would that would pay off at some point in the future uh, time t from now right so so again this looks uh, very similar um, that we're just gonna look at, at really two different uh, rates of return, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be our risk-free, but we're gonna compare it against the risk-free of whatever the, um, the currency is, is denominated in. So it could be like a Euro risk-free rate or a British pound or, you know, who, whoever uh, has a currency out there that you're wanting to engage uh, in this type of trade with. Um, so th this is just trying to get, um, again, we can sort of talk through um, how the, the spot and the, the forward works. Cause we, we have, um, let's say this, this foreign currency, right? Um, if we took that currency, right? And then switched it to dollars. So that's going down the, the right-hand side. Right, so it'd be a thousand like euro, for instance, we would convert that to dollars at time zero. And then at time T in the future, we would have 1000 times that exchange rate that existed at that time zero. And then we would grow that E to the RT, okay? Alternatively, right, you could say, hey, I will get 100 times E to the risk-free rate as R, right? Because it's in that currency. So it would be whatever a Euro bank would give me, right? Um, so E to the RFT, right? Um, which would, would give me that um, in the future. And then in the future, I could convert that to dollars. So 1,000 E to the RFT, right? Times whatever that exchange is in the future, right? And so these two should converge. Um, and that's, that's part of how we've... Um, uh, come up with our calculation, right? So, okay, so if you if you kind of think back here, right? So it's like 1000 F0 E to the RF sub T equals 1000 S0 E to the RT. We'll get rid of the thousands, right? And so we end up with F0 times E to the RFT. And so when I took that E to the RFT to the other side, that's why this is a negative sign here. Right, so so that is showing like that's that's where this is coming from, right? Because this should be equal to this, and that's what gets us this equation, and that's why it's R, the the rate of return we're going to get, minus the risk free rate that they would be in whatever the foreign currency is. Um, this is a, a, a different approach. So instead of saying, hey, we've got this periodic income, uh, we're basically saying, well, storage is negative income. It's a cost that we have. So we're going to treat it like we did all of the 
income stuff, but the sign is going to go the other way. So instead of saying minus Q, we'll say plus little u for the storage cost. And instead of saying minus I, we'll say plus capital U uh, if it's a, a storage cost instead of fixed dollar amount. Right. So if I'm told that, hey, you're renting um, a, a tanker, you know, sitting off the coast of Houston, um, you know, there's um, just it's just floating there, right? And they tell me it's a flat dollar amount, um, then I would use this capital U. Uh, if I have um, a storage company that I'm working with in you know, Galveston or maybe uh, New Orleans or somewhere that for all those local refineries in, in Texas and Louisiana, uh, and they're, they give me a percentage or something like that, uh, then you would use this uh, exponential form. Okay, um, cost of carry is a little bit different um, because we, in the previous one, right, we're, we're talking about storage and cost of carry, you're also having to consume or you're, you're thinking about things like, well, I could have taken that money tied up in oil sitting in a tanker, right, this is waiting um, out there. Um, I could have taken that money and bought T-bills and just get a rate of return. It's sitting in oil generates no income, right? In fact, it costs me money because I have to pay to store it, right? Um, and so that, that's why we're, we're, uh, we talk about cost of carry because it's not just the storage cost, but it's also the fact that, hey, I, I could have uh, earned more income. Um, and this, this is a legitimate concern when you're, when you're holding um, for a while. Right, so, um, but you'll just notice that instead of R, uh, they just use C uh, up here. Um, and so we're just saying, look, we're not getting our R, right? Remember we said R minus um, lower U. Um, now we're, we're just gonna call this C because we're, we're gonna give up that, that R as well. Um, and so we would say this, we would expect this to be equal, but for a consumption asset, we're like, actually, this could be less than, right? Because there's that consumption market. It's different than gold that's going to sit in a vault in a, a New York bank and oil that's sitting in a tanker right off the coast of a large refinery system, right? So, um, so you, you may actually get this inequality, um, but they could be equal as well. Um, and the convenience yield, uh, you'll also see, right, which will be lower still. Um, and the convenience yield normally has to do with those consumable uh, assets, right? Because it's, it is just really handy. Think about like with the winter storms, you know, all the, the power plants that have large um, fuel oil stores, right? There's a, there's a, something to be said for the convenience of it just being right there, right? So, um, so there's that, um, the, the expectation. So whenever you see this capital E, um, around something that means the expected value of, right? So I don't know what it's going to be at S sub T. I can tell you what it is at S sub zero, cause I can go look at the paper. Right. Um, but I don't know exactly what it's going to be in the future, but I would expect for you, you to see, okay, well, whatever this um, fo uh, the this futures are forward, right? I could invest that money today, right? And based on that investment, I could get some rate of return, right? This expected return of K, right? So I could I could take whatever this would be in the future, discount it to the present day. F sub zero times e to the negative RT, right? And then grow that times what this expected return is. And then we would say, okay, well, we would expect to have this as that um, uh, future spot, right? So again, this looks a little bit different than what we, we had before because we had F sub zero and this was S sub zero e to the RT. Um, and if we said e to the R minus QT, you, you would, understand that, okay, this is like some uh, return that, that uh, will, will be paid. 
Uh, and this time we're using this little K because we expect that we don't know that we're going to get K. That's just what the market expects us to get. But interest rates fluctuate daily. So, it, I mean, we could get something very different. Um, chances are we're going to get something a little bit different. Um, but, you know, that's just how investments work, right? So, um, and so we would, this is, again, this expectation, but just because we expect something doesn't mean it's what's going to happen. Um, and so um, this is the, the systemic risk. Um, you probably saw this um, when you were do, dealing with um, building portfolios, you know, and we talked about betas and, and things like that and, and how risky uh, things are relative um, to, the, to the market, you know. And so um, if K is equal to R, you know, that's, that's like the um, beta of zero giving you the risk-free rate of return, right? And so in that case, then we would expect the, the equality to hold, right? The, the future will be the expectation because K is, would be, end up being equal to R. Um, some things we expect to have higher betas, we expect to have more of this systemic risk, right? It doesn't have to be one because one is the, the systemic risk of the market, right? So it could be, but greater than zero, right? But it could also, of course, be greater than one, but the bigger this number is, the more this is bigger than that, meaning this expectation is that much higher than whatever this future forward is currently. Right. And so when we look at, at stock market um, indices or stock market, uh, even just a portfolio, you, you would expect um, that to be higher just because the, the market does have this systemic risk. Right. The market as a whole can can act together and crash together or, or rally together. So um, the negative systemic risk, this would be like the negative beta investment. So things like gold, uh, that's, that's kind of our, our go to although it doesn't always hold um, because of investor actions and stuff, but uh, that relationship, um, you know, causes that the, the existing uh, future forward price would be greater than whatever that expectation is. All right. Well, I, um, that, that's the end of the lecture five. Uh, I'm putting this on YouTube and I'll put a link on Blackboard. Um, I'll put up a, a homework assignment and everything for you guys to look at as well. Um, and then hopefully the, we'll be back to at least synchronous, um, you know, conversations and things like that um, starting next week. It depends on how this weather holds and if this, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we, right now we're, we're being directed to try to do as much as possible asynchronously because of uh, students having power and, and connectivity issues with all of the snow. So um, do not hesitate to email me though. Uh, I got a couple of emails yesterday. I responded to those students. So, so please, if you have any questions or concerns, um, just come and, uh, and, and email me and let me know. Thank you.